Okay, and so here we have with us Sam Harris. Thanks very much for joining us, Sam, and exercising your right to reply and hopefully having an interesting chat with Chris as well. Yeah, good to see you, gentlemen. I believe, Sam, that you listened to the episode that we did on you, which which must have been a joy, a great entertaining moment, and have some points that you'd like to you know, raise with us or push back on. And then, assuming we end up with time uh, there's some other topics that we would might cover that we have different opinions on but i think some of them might come up in the points that you might raise so let's see but thanks for coming on yeah happy to do it it's interesting when people do so the floor is yours yeah well i, I seem to remember again i did listen to the the uh, audio but um it's been a while i seem to remember two things stood out one one is that you faulted me for my um, lab leak episode with Matt Ridley and Alina Chan. Um, you seem to wish that I had done much more adversarial research and was far less credulous on the on the point of the lab leak hypothesis. And you seem to, to suggest that I had some commitment to believing in a lab leak as opposed to a zoonotic origin, which really, which really I don't. I mean, the, the, my only um, hobby horse to ride into that conversation was that I, the, the lab leak hypothesis always struck me as totally plausible and not at all racist. And as you know, it was immediately condemned as a, as, you know, as a, a racist symptom of, of bigotry, um, uh, largely because, you know, it's some version of it had come out of Trump's mouth. Um, but it was always plausible and, and it, it is in fact still plausible. I mean, I, you know, I, I've since listened to your episode, which followed mine, you know, where you, you know, you, um, brought on your, you, you had your experts on. Um, and yes, if I had heard that before I recorded with Matt and Alina, I might've asked a few more skeptical questions, but, but the truth is even in the aftermath of hearing your episode, it's still, you know, the jury's still out. On, it's still totally respectable to believe that that um, a lab leak is at least still possible. And I, as you know, it, the intelligence community is split on it. I think the FBI and the DOE still uh, claim that it's uh, likely a, of lab origin uh, based on evidence that is not publicly available, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and as for trusting the... Um, community of virologists, uh, yeah, there are reasons to, you know, this, this also came out a little bit in my, my episode with, with Matt and Alina, there are reasons to worry that, that the, you know, the world's leading virologists were not altogether forthcoming, both around what happened and or around what they actually suspected. Um, Donald McNeil, the New York times writer who, um, Cover, has covered pandemics for 25 years for the times until he was until he was defenestrated for you know woke reasons uh, as you might know um, he just came out with a book talking about how he knows that the, some of the leading virologists in America really lied to him I mean they kind of circled the wagons and he, he I think through a Freedom of Information Act he got their slack communication and they were they were collaborating to lead him astray when he was reporting on the possibility of a lab leak, you know, early on, for, you know, again, working for the New York Times. Uh, and he's talked about that in his, in his book. That is, again, this has come out since I recorded my podcast. Um, so, I, you know, I, again, I would, if I were going to do that, uh, that interview again, again with, with Matt and Alina, I would, I would plow in a few of your skeptical points from your episode, certainly, but it's just, uh, it's still sort of in coin toss zone for me, whether it's it's zoonotic or, or lab leak. And we certainly can't trust the CCP to be forthcoming and transparent on this subject. I mean, they have not been good collaborators at all in this. They've, been, they've just been stark adversaries as far as I know. So, um, you know, I don't trust the virologists entirely. I mean, I, I, I've done other episodes on my concern around virus hunting and, you know, the deep vision program that has since been abandoned for the United States was, in my mind, a, a total scandal intellectually and, and ethically. I think a lot of that work is deeply suspect. And the fact that, that there are any virologists who don't see that now is um, is a, of great concern to me. Um, so, um, 
Yeah, I mean that's a, that's just that's, you know that's kind of my vomiting up my my memory of what my reaction was when I heard your your criticism. There's a there's a couple of points there, Sam. That I think like one thing that we would definitely agree on is that it's not off the table to reasonable scientists, non scientists who consider the possibility of a lab leak. And I I think all of the experts that we discussed with also made that point, and also that even that you know. It's perfectly reasonable that people would be skeptical when they hear various details and that we are right to not trust, you know, the CCP account, which to be clear, they were also denying that there were any, you know, relevant animals being sold in markets initially and so on. So the CCP, like not being forthcoming, seems like a, a given that most uh, most actors in this space yeah. would agree on. Actually, the one point I would add there, uh, which I forgot to say, is that it, it's always struck me as strange that there is this preference for the zoonotic wet market story, because that actually strikes me as politically the more invidious and you know not to say racist uh, account. I mean, it's just it, I, I just think it's it, it's a worse look for the Chinese to be maintaining these atrocious wet markets at you know and imperiling all of humanity because they can't figure out how to stop eating raccoon dogs and pangolins and the, all the other crap they have in these markets piled on top of each other. Um, it's just that that looks more barbaric and insane than a lab leak. I mean, the lab leaks happen to everyone. The, the most civilized, most careful societies have lab leaks. We know that. And it's a, it's, it's a great concern. But the idea that there would be this passionate bias uh, as a as a hedge against so called racism uh, and xenophobia for a, a zoonotic origin makes absolutely no sense to me. Yeah, of course you're talking about like political narratives and preferences and spin right, but that, and but that so is on. the preference we I detect in in the reaction to the to anyone who has speculated about a lab leak. Uh, yeah, I mean the the other lens that to look at it. I mean this is how we try to approach it is that you focus on the scientific evidence rather than the spin either way. And, you know, yeah. the as far as I understand, the scientific consensus has only firmed up since the interviews that you had and, 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 and we had. You know, the discourse is always there. There's, there's, there's always political stuff going on. Trump was definitely using the issue as a political football. There was definitely a reaction against that, you know, claiming uh, about xenophobia and racism, whatever. But that's all on the surface of the discourse, right? Underneath that, you either believe that all the scientists are corrupt and they're all in the pocket of somebody, or you believe that there is actually a community of career virologists, experts and specialists who don't really care much about Trump or the CCP or anything like that and mm. are actually beavering away to figure out you know, the evidence on where the virus actually came from. And I would say, Sam, that the, like the experts we spoke to, one of them, Michael Warbay, for example, was on a paper originally arguing for more efforts to be put into investigating the lab leak origins. But he subsequently changed his position based on, you know, right. investigations and evidence. And all the experts that we talked to in that episode, they weren't saying it's racist they ever consider it. They were saying the overwhelming weight of evidence continues to point to this being likely you know they were talking about the genetic evidence and the epidemiological evidence and and so on and on the counter side and this is kind of the criticism i think the main criticism that at least i was levying is that very recently there was an expert survey on you know the the general weight that you attach a probability to a lab leak versus a natural zoonosis origin and it, the results show from like epidemiologists and virologists overwhelmingly the consensus is that a uh, lab leak is less likely right it's something like 80 percent in relevant virologists were on the side of natural zoonosis being more likely but that's still saying that there's scope for disagreement but alina chan and matt ridley in this case when you spoke to them they kind of presented the case that there was a very strong implication that virologists are potentially conspiring to hide their own culpability. And mm. in the case of a lot of the people that we're talking to, that clearly doesn't seem to be the motivation. Whereas on the lab leak side, there are people who now have profiles purely about promoting the lab leak as a possibility. And in the case of Matt Ridley, who I know is a respected science writer, and I know that many people are fond of him, Richard Dawkins reads him and so on, but he also does have a history 
of advocating various fringe positions, including on climate contrarianism, alternative origins, the HIV, AIDS. Well, that, that, just to be clear, that, that I knew nothing about. But again, you, can't, you, could, you have to take people's views as they come. I mean, obviously, some people can entertain sufficiently crazy ideas that I would never want to talk to them. But um, and, and RFK Jr. is one of those people. But um, yeah, I mean, Matt is a is a totally respected science writer about biology, and he's written a, you know, a bunch of books that many people have found valuable. And as you as you say, Dawkins is one of them. Um, and yeah, I, I can't you know I can't be held responsible for views of his that I'm I'm not aware of. I know he's been somewhat contrarian about with respect to climate, but. There's a bunch of people in that bin who, um, who should, we we can't we can't cancel. You know, you talked about uh, in the usually in the context of you know the rampant conspiracism that you see all over the place, but including in I don't know the Brett Weinstein side of the ad, wherever that is, right? Mm-hmm. You know, or or Alex Jones or Elon Musk, and they show a tendency to endorse a wide variety of conspiracies. It isn't just one. It's you know that yeah. there is a history of conspiracism, that it should lower your assessment when they're alleging another conspiracy, right? Like at least not that the conspiracy is true, but the fact that they are alleging it means something significant because they are prone to allege conspiracies. So in that case, I heard you very eloquently talk about, you know, with Joe Rogan or Brett Weinstein, that they're selecting experts on COVID, you know, people like Pierre Corey or Robert Malone, who have genuine credentials, uh, Peter McCulloch, and they then give their audience the impression that because there's no respectable figure uh, to kind of like to be it back the, the following week, that the fringe position is much more firm and, and convincing than it is. So there seemed the potential parallel there from if your podcast has on like Alina Chan and Matt Ridley and then leaves the lab leak issue alone. I would imagine that a lot of your audience would come away thinking that a lot of the criticisms that they put are convincing because they pushed them in a very convincing way. So like the, the experts that we had on, if you think those questions are worth answering, why not seek out to, you know, raise them with them? Well, I, again, I, I would have had I known them. Again, you had you, you did your podcast after I did mine, right? So I didn't have the, ben- you know, I, I need a time machine to to f- be fully informed. And it is true that I didn't, you know, I didn't do much more than read their book to prepare for that interview. So it's not like I, I, um, I went into this having preloaded my brain with lots of reasons to be skeptical of, of their thesis. And, but, but actually the, 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 the line we took in that interview was, was I thought fairly balanced. I mean, I, you know, anyone listening to that interview would come out feeling like, well, it, the lab leak certainly seems very likely or, or, or more likely than not, perhaps I me, mean, but it's still, it was still sort of in coin toss zone. It wasn't like this is 99%, you know, uh, we we have a 90, 90% confidence that, that, that it was, it was of lab origin. Uh, and, and neither Matt nor Alina were, were claiming that. Um, I mean, I think I've probably here in your interviews, I probably became a little more skeptical of the, of the lab leak origin, but Still, now, I, I mean, again, it's still not a decided question. You still have the Department of Energy and the FBI saying it's it's likely based on evidence that we can't see. And again, you got you should listen to Donald McNeil's account of of uh, or read read his account in his recent book of what it was like to deal with the virologists, right? I mean, he, like there was a circling of the wagons. There was not. There was a pretending to 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 be settled on zoonotic origin when behind closed doors they were saying oh shit this looks like a lab leak right so i'm um, you know i'm not as far as you know that doesn't answer the 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 basic scientific charge that your guest made which i think is is very interesting i i, I, I forget some of the details but if memory serves perhaps the most interesting was that it looks like there were two origin stories right from uh, that, that that suggests to, more of a, a zoonotic origin as opposed to a, a, a lab leak origin. Um, but in any case, it's, um, 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I don't know that we can extract much more wisdom from this. I, I yeah. realize I didn't do the interview you wished I had done, but it is just true that I, you know, I did not have much prior bias one way or the other going in. It just, my, my really strong bias was everyone who was claiming that the lab leak thesis was racism was a moron, right? And, and should be chastised uh, uh, as such until the end of the okay. world. So um, yeah. that's, that's uh, still where I stand. Okay. I think, I think Chris disputes some of the minor points <laughs> in some of that, but we're not going to let him uh, respond. We, we, can, we can let the lab leak lie, I think, for now. So, um, Sam, was there anything else you wanted to respond to from that episode? Well, I think I remember you – I forget how you um, – what your focus was in the conversation, but you seem to be saying that many of my claims about – um, what one can realize through meditation. I think in particular that the illusoriness of, of the self, um, that those were kind of merely subjective claims that I was kind of, uh, trumping up into some, uh, uh, greater than rational, uh, status as objective claims, right? Like, like, like I, I get like the, the, the path by which I'm, seeking to make uh, credible uh, uh, claims about the nature of, of human subjectivity is not one that can be can, that can actually be walked because all it really is is a matter of personal experience or per you know personal opinion down that path I mean introspection on some level can't bear objective fruit and I would I would just challenge that I mean what, what's happening what I heard happening in your description I mean, you might want to just uh, give your criticism again so that our that our listeners can hear it. But what seemed to be happening for me is that you were confusing the um, the linguistic claims for the 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 reality uh, indicated, right? Like yes, what when talked about, it is just language, right? These are these are just you know small mouth noises that I'm making now, and anything I say about the nature of mind is just going to be a, a string of sentences. But what I'm talking about isn't just at bottom a string of sentences, and there there, there are features of the mind of, that we that we can only experience directly from a first person side, about, about which we can nevertheless make objective claims. Right? They, these are not merely subjective claims, not merely biased, not merely personal. There, there's a functionally infinite number of things you can say about the mind from a first person point of view. Which are nonetheless objective, not you know epistemologically objective, while ontologically subjective. I think I got lost somewhere there, Chris. <laughs> sorry, um, and it's partly that I'm a little bit vague about the the, the well, crux well, of the actually, issue. Well, let me just sharpen that up with a couple of claims. So, for instance, hmm. um, I mean, I can again. I it may sound. Um, uh, hyperbolic for me to say you can make, make an infinite number of claims about the mind, the su subjecti subjectivity of people uh, that are n mm. ne nevertheless objective, but yeah, but you obviously can, right? So, for instance, I can I can say, you know, what was John F. Kennedy thinking the moment he got assassinated, right? Well, we don't know, but there's an infinite number of things he wasn't thinking, and we can rule those out absolutely, right? He was not f it, attempting to factor the largest prime number human beings have discovered in the years since, right? He wasn't thinking about string theory. He wasn't thinking about what a genius Edward Witten is, right? He, he just add, add, the, add your propositions that he was not entertaining, you know, ad libitum. He's, it's just, these are objective claims about his mind, right? Um, we know what we, we these are things that, that we can rule out, right? This, so we're talking about his subjectivity, we're talking about what it was like to be him from a first po person point of view, and we're making claims about what wasn't there, right in his in his conscious mind, um, and so that, that so that that's just one way to see that you can make objective claims about subjective states of mind without any doubt. Engaging in introspective practices, I would concede that there are there are basic experiences that the the nature of the way that human minds operate that if somebody is to engage in you know introspective practices in a certain way that they will very likely have those experiences right and i think that accords with what you're saying about you know being able to make statements that are 
objectively true or you know that you can introspect and, and see for yourself if it's easy to not make thoughts about the future and past arise in your mind when you just sit right it, it, it would be very strange if somebody sat down and said oh i had no problem doing that right that you'd met a quite interesting person in that case but from there there are plenty of different introspective traditions and spiritual religious philosophical practices that investigate mind using introspective practices and arrive at rather different conclusions about the nature of mind. Now, there are mystics and comparative religious people who have tried to argue that they're essentially just grasping the elephant from all different points, but the conclusions of a transcendental meditation practitioner and a Dzogchen Buddhist are often different because, in part, of the framing that those traditions have provided to help interpret those experiences. And our yeah. argument, I think, is that you, like all people who engage in those practices, have inherited a particular like interpretive framework, which you tend to present as uh, reflecting a, a kind of universal insight that people from any tradition well, no. could have. Well, no, it's, but, it's universal. Just to be like, it's it's universal if it's true, right? So I, I fully agree with you that there are different traditions and they don't totally agree. And from my point of view, the various traditions are more or less cluttered with concepts. Some concepts are more useful than others. Um, some teachings, you know, I, I do somewhat take the, the Buddhist view that some teachings are more appropriate for different sorts of people. So there's, there's a kind of a skillful means argument that so some some of these differences, seeming differences of opinion can be reconciled with a different skillful uh, differences of skillful means for depending on the audience um but i think yes i think there are maps that fit the territory better than others um and but there is a territory right there and there there are there are certain you know you're you're talking at the leading edge yes there might be differences of opinion um and there's certainly difference of differences with respect to the metaphysical picture suggested by the experiences that practitioners have, and and I'm and I'm very um, slow to draw any metaphysical conclusions from any experience. I'm very, you know, I'm I'm fairly skeptical about, the, you know, all of that. So um, I don't tend to talk like Deepak Chopra and and say that the you know because you experienced this thing in the darkness of your closed eyes, you now know something about cosmology, right? So that the, these are what what I'm what I claim is that we can make objective claims about the nature of experience not about the nature of the cosmos on the basis of meditation and and one and there well, there are many claims that there would be no disagreement about really no matter how how different the traditions are like for instance that you know thoughts arise and pass away right your thoughts are not permanent you know you think you know, there, there's this experience of you know first there was that, that particular thought of what you ate for lunch yesterday wasn't there a moment ago and now it's there and there it's gone right so it's they there, there's a transitory quality to the to the flow of thought right to the to each each increment of thought that you can you can you know, you th think about distinctly um or experience distinctly so anyone who's claiming that that doesn't happen and you know thoughts are permanent you know that would be an odd person to have a conversation with right uh, it's, it's almost like saying that you know sounds are permanent, right? Or or sentences are permanent. All right, uh, this sentence eventually comes to an end. You know, period, full stop. Um, so do, so does the analogous thought. Uh, but that's again, that's an, uh, there. There's not, certain things follow from that, right? I mean, so the, if you can be, if you can notice the transitory nature of of mental objects, you know, thoughts included. Um, any and emotions, right? You know that the states, the st a state of anger it can't be permanent, right? Because it, it wasn't there a moment ago. Whatever physiology that that constitute it, uh, constitutes it in this moment is by its very by the sheer fact that it arose is it, 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 it will prove impermanent. It's not going to be there for a week and a half, right? It's not even going to be there for an hour. It's not even going to be there. So, and here here we get closer to a an objective claim that's kind of interesting and and certainly psychologically useful i would uh, the claim is that it's not going to be there for even minutes unless you get lost in thought about the reasons why you're angry again so that I, I you can't sustain the emotional reaction of anger 
for more than orders of sec seconds or tens of seconds, I would I would claim, unless you then unless you get lost in thought in a very dreamlike way, identified with thought about why you're angry, right? And so that's that is you know this is the first useful thing I've said from a meditative point of view. That offers a key to how you can become free of anger if you want to be. You can notice the linkage between thought and emotion and break the connection. You can, you can notice thoughts as thought and how they're impermanent. You can notice the physiology of anger and how it's impermanent. And you can, you can continually break the spell of identification with thought and notice that the half life, that, that, that an emotion like anger has a certain half life and is very, very brief, right? Astoundingly brief. And, and there's liberation from anger to be found in that. Again, this is anyone adequate to be to, to the task of, of observing this, right? And, and, and not everybody is, and it takes a little training to become so, can, can converge on an agreement about the nature of this experience, right? And anyone who says, oh, no, that's complete bullshit. Whenever I get angry, it lasts for, for 17 hours, uh, and I'm not thinking at all at, at that time. I know that person is unable to witness certain things about them, about the, about what it's like to be them, um, ba based on just a lack of facility or a lack of training. And you can know that every bit as much as you can know, um, you know, that somebody you know claiming to run a three minute mile is just he's got he's got a broken stopwatch, right? It's just mm. it's just not so, happening, so right? Sam, I'm, I'm I might jump in and, and reply. I I'm a little bit vague on exactly what my issue was too. I think it partly could be the idea of pointing to subjective experience and like, for instance, the benefits you experience from meditation mm. as as the kind of evidence for the, a, a particular way of, of looking at things. And I don't dispute that that may well be true. I've got nothing against meditation. I'm all for self-reflection. I'm all for taking a pause, practicing a bit of self-awareness, especially the way you just phrased it then. It's kind of, it's just good advice, right? It's home, it's homespun <laughs> wisdom, perhaps in some ways, but that, that's the kind of advice I'd, I'd give to like a, a young person, for instance, who was, who was a bit emotional and not practicing a bit of mm -hmm. self-reflection. The problem is, is when we point to our own subjective experiences, right? Like the the immense calmness and groundedness that we're experiencing by doing X, then ultimately other people have to take it on faith a little bit, right? Un unless they do the thing that we're telling them to do. So in terms of epistemology or whatever, it's not fundamentally that different from the revealed truth that a mystic doing any other kind of thing saying that he's getting messages from God or pulling them out of a hat or something like that. Well, uh, well I know no, it's, it's quite different. Elegant. It's quite different because again, I'm not making that the lurch into metaphysics, right? If, if you, if you're um, claiming to be hearing the voice of God right now, you, you, you might be claiming to hear voices and that's a, that can be an honest claim about which I, I really wouldn't doubt. If someone said to me, you know, listen, I, I hear a voice and it's not my own. Well, you know, then we're talking about schizophrenia or we're talking about, you know, something. But the claim that this is the voice of God is is a um, is a metaphysical claim. It's a claim about what the, what the, 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 the relationship between this person's subjectivity and other entities in the cosmos. And it's it's testable. Right. So, like, if, if I wanted to test whether someone was actually hearing the voice of an omniscient being, I would ask that voice a few questions, right? And that it's, it's provable. It, the, the person could give me answers of a sort that would prove that that they're in contact with some kind of superhuman intelligence, right? I, I could, I, you know, I, I have a a um, I could write down a on a piece of paper a you know a fifteen digit number and known only to me, not even known to me because I can't even remember it. I just wrote it down and I've forgotten it, right? And it's in my desk. Tell me what that number is, right? If the person can tell me what that number is based on this voice they're hearing, okay, I'm all ears. Let's let's talk about the the, the miraculous situation we're in, right? Uh, so th all of this is is amenable to to testing. The claim I'm making, I mean, and I think that the claim that you were most uncomfortable with was not so much like the impermanence of thought or the impermanence of emotion, which seems kind of this remedial self help technique, but the more 
the spookier claim that the the ego is an illusion, right? The sense of there being a subject in the center of consciousness is an illusion. And, and, and I will admit that is a that's a claim I'm making that is not just for me and it's not just for people who agree with me. It's for you, whether you realize it or not, right? So it's 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 there's a kind of um you know um it's an intrusive claim. It it, it purports to be objective. And the analogy I would give uh, which I've given before, and perhaps even on your podcast, is to the like to, to the optic blind spot, right? So, like the like I have a I have a story as to why the optic blind spot is there to be noticed. I also have a story as to why it's hard to notice and why most people don't notice it, and and it requires a little training to notice it. And some people also notice it, and they it doesn't it's not even interesting, or it's like so what, right? All of that maps on to the to the territory of of so-called self-transcendence or noticing the illusoriness of of the self rather faithfully right it's it's neuroanatomically plausible that this would be true um and it's uh as as is the case with the optic blind, blind spot it's hard to notice you know arguably harder to notice with respect to meditating on the on the illusoriness of the self um and it can be noticed and then overlooked again, right? And it's it, it, in the same way that the blind spot can. But it's 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 an objective claim in the same way. The only difference is it's hard, a little bit harder. Uh, in so in some cases, maybe a lot harder to confirm. Um, and I, I can't easily say I can't I, I, you, know, you know we can't use a piece of paper and a pencil. To do it in a way that is is super reliable because it is harder, right? And, and that's just an accident of, of the you know the just what it takes to notice this thing. I think something that might tighten up the disagreement here is that when I've heard you present this, you know, you tend to frame it that people they don't like the thought of not having a permanent self, right? It's a kind of challenge to most people's notions of identity. Yeah, some people, yeah. Yeah, but if they engage in the practice, they'll come to see that. And I had and have an interest in introspective practices. I focused on Buddhist traditions for my initial studies because of like an interest in, in that, which I think mirrors a lot of the interest that you had, you know, when younger as well, and you've retained the interest. But Whenever I engage in introspective practices, whenever I use your app as well, most of the things about the self that you point out about, you know, that when people try to grasp that idea of a little homunculus, it, it falls apart on observation, right? But I agree with pretty much all of the, the kind of insights that you can gain from introspective practices about the way that the minds are operating and the narratives that they're constructing and so on. But I haven't reach the same conclusion as you or a lot of Buddhists in regard the notion that like self is non-existent, except to say that the popular conception of self is non-existent, but there are aspects because like you can focus on an individual moment and kind of go down the layers of analysis until you get to the level of atoms and you, and then say, well, where's the actual person, right? It's just vibrating forces around and in the same way you can go through thought processes down to the individual thoughts and you know reactions in the the individual arising moments in consciousness but the patterns in the brain and like the way that it's structured life experiences are consistent patterns over time right that's why we have personalities that's why we have autobiographical memories mm -hmm. and to me saying that the sense or autobiographical sense is a complete illusion is it, it yeah, sounds that's, that's more... not what i'm saying though part of the confusion might be on, on what what self are we talking about right so there are many ways we can use the term self and there's really only one that i'm claiming is illusory right i mean the others are are um you might say are, are constructed they, they might not be what they seem either right i mean like you they're they're mm. they're they're subjective to they're su they're subject to a kind of deflationary analysis of the sort you just suggested right so you if you if you, you look at it you know any object closely enough it, it resolves into its constituent parts and you know the object itself is not in any of the parts right and so, and so it, there's this sort of mirage like quality to everything that we we decompose 
Uh, and so the, we, you know, everything is just a, an, a, um, this is, this is a, a, a Buddhist trope. I mean, just to going back to, um, a famous, uh, sutta, the, you know, the, the, the questions of King Melinda, where he, he was, he was asking uh, the, the, um, uh, Nagasena, the, uh, the, the monk was asking, you know, is, is a chariot in the wheel in the axle in the, in the rope in the carriage in the seat? And you know you can't find a chariot in any of the chariot parts, and you bring all the parts together, and you have a chariot. Uh, and and the, and the question is, like, at what point do we actually get a chariot? I mean, you can talk about a chariot without an axle, but you really can't talk about a chariot without a wheel, an axle, a carriage, and you know every every other chariot part. Uh, and so it is with any aggregate thing. You can imagine a person missing a hand, but you can't really imagine a person missing, you know, a hundred different parts and still be a person. Um, I'm not saying that people are illusions, right? I'm, I, and I'm not saying that, that that it's mysterious that you have your memories and I have my memories, and I, you know, that you know, why don't I wake up tomorrow with all of your memories, right? Like that, that's not so that like that there's no there's no mystery about personal identity of that sort. Um, the the self that is illusory, the uh, you know that that is in fact spurious, that, that doesn't survive analysis, and that you can actually experience to be absent is the self as the presumed subject of experience, right? So mo again, most, and forgive me, I feel like we must have had this almost an identical conversation of this sort last time, but I mean, just to, to remind you and your listeners, um, the claim is that most of us, you know, certainly most of us, but you know, perhaps not all of us, but most of us, most of the time feel like certainly prior to any real experience with meditation, feel like there is, it, it, we don't feel identical to our experience, right? We feel like we're having experience from almost from someplace outside of experience or on the edge of experience, right? There's this, this feeling of being a subject, a, a locus of consciousness, an aimer of attention, and if you're talking about action, a willer of will, this this entity that has free will, right? The free whole free will conversation is just the other side of this coin, right? The, the feeling of agency. It's, it's me here doing these things. I'm pushing these sentences out, right? I'm having thoughts. I'm the thinker of my thoughts, and I'm the doer of my doings, right? And I'm, you know, if I'm going to reach for something, I it's a, I'm I'm the motive force. I'm the as the subject. And so there's this sense that there's an observer. Right, it's almost like you're looking over your own shoulder into the you know, theater of your experience, um, and then there's and then there's the things you experience. You ex you have sights and sounds and sensations and thoughts and emotions, and it's all changing. And yet there's this something static about the the the, the subject. Right, there's, there's almost a sense that there's an unchanging subject that gets carried through moment to moment. Um, that subject, the feeling that there's a, a, a man in the boat, right? Or that you're on the bank of the river, uh, you know, watching the, the, the river of consciousness go, flow by, that is the illusion. When, if you, when you look for that subject clearly enough and precisely enough, if you're attentive, attentive enough to what it's actually like to look for the one who is looking, right? You can kind of, there's a, there's a subjectively speaking, there's a needle to thread here. And it is, again, somewhat analogous to looking for the optic blind spot under the right conditions. You can confirm for your, yourself the absence of data. I mean, just as if I give you the piece of paper and the, with the two marks on it and you stare at one, you stare at the fixation cross and you move at the other, the dot, you know, f you know, in and out of your, you know, in and out of existence in your visual field, you can confirm for yourself uh, that there's this area in the in the, in in the retina that you, where you're getting no data, right? Where you're just where there's just an absence of 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 visual experience. Um, you can do meditation, you know, this kind of meditation on the nature of of the of the self, you know, uh, or in in, in Buddhist terms, uh, you know, on uh, anatta, selflessness, or shunyata, emptiness, depending on how you want to think about it. Um, you can play at the boundary of that sense of self and no self in, in, in a refined enough way and in a meticulous enough way so as to confirm your, for yourself that this, this feeling of subject, the feeling that you are divided from your experience in, su in the subject-object 
way is spurious, right? And that there really is, as a matter of experience, only experience, right? And there's not, you're not on the edge of it. You're not in the middle of it. You're identical to it, right? There is this, there is this totality of, of, of energy, sight, sound, sensation, everything in your sensorium, including your mind and its, and its objects. And there's no boundary between you and any of it, that there is no you to be aiming the spotlight of attention into it or onto it, right? Um, and there's a, there are many things that follow from that insight. The more you can explore it, the more you can sort of unpack its significance psychologically. Um, but so there's a lot to be said about that. And there, as Chris pointed out, there are differences of opinion about the metaphysics of all of that and what, you know, and, and what any of that means and what we, what, what we should think on the basis of, of that experience. But this is a, you know, if there, if there is an experience that exists at the heart of the perennial philosophy that unites all of these mystical traditions to some degree, um, it's this, it's the intimation of this experience that again, in certain contexts, it immediately gets layered with what, what I consider to be bogus, you know, religious concepts and metaphysics, but there is this ground truth. I mean, you, I mean, it really is the ground of being by another name, um, that can be, discovered. And that's, again, it's an objective claim, but it's a very simple claim. And it takes, you know, in my, again, in my case, I probably spent a year on silent retreat and st still couldn't reliably notice this about my, my mind. Right. So it's like, I was, you know, and by silent retreat, I meant, I mean, like, you know, really doing nothing, but meditate for 12 to 18 hours a day you know, I, I did that, you know, the longest I ever did was three months, but I did that twice and I did two months many times and one month. And I'd probably done at least a year before I got enough, I got you know, kind of the crucial instruction for me that, that allowed me to, to notice this, uh, you know, just, just very directly without any, you know, real effort. And, and, and that was a, I mean, as Chris said, I mean, that was in a Dzogchen context. So there is a, there's a role for, precise information here. I think it matters that to have, you have, if you have a confusing map, it's not going to be surprising that you're confused about the territory. And, um, I, I view some maps as, as intrinsically confusing, but anyway, that's, it's, it's an, it's a subject, it's an experiment you can, you can run on yourself and yes, it's it can be frustrating. It can be, it can sound grandiose. It can sound, um, certainly adjacent to mystical and religious claims that, that do not have good scientific bona fides, but there's nothing unscientific about this. It really is. You, you can, you can tackle this very much in the spirit of scientific hypothesis and ultimately confirm it or not. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it, the, granted it is somewhat, um, I mean, it's confusing what to make of one's failure to confirm it, right? Like if you go, if you went on a 10 day retreat and you didn't experience anything like this and you, and you came away thinking, well, there's no there, there, you know, I, I would, I, you know, I would have nothing to say, but try harder. Right. But, um, the problem is this insight can't be physically demonstrated in a way that some things can, like if, if I was telling you, well, it's possible to hit a golf ball 300 yards, right? And here's how to do it. And then you have someone like Tiger Woods who can do it, just go up and do it, right? Then it doesn't matter how much you struggle and fail to do it. You still know it can be done, right? You know, like you've just saw someone else do it. Um, and there's some... Um, Sam, uh, just, Sam uh, for, I think um, certain we things, might have to... Just, uh, can't be demonstrated in that way. Yeah, yeah. I take that point. I'm sorry to jump in and cut you off, but I, I think we've, um, we're not going to get to the bottom of metaphysics in <laughs> 25 minutes, but um, we've definitely given it a, a good go. Um, okay. Just because you have to go shortly, um, I thought we might move on to s some other topics. Sam, okay. maybe this, uh, I can tie two together that are, sure. I, I think, related. And um, I can't remember if it came up in the past content, but I know you've thought about it quite a bit. So you've done a number of episodes on the Palestine and uh, Israel conflict, understandably, and took quite a strong line in presenting it as as kind of the forces of civilization fighting, you know, the, the kind of jihadism, uh, extremism. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of points I'd like to raise there, but one is that you very strongly emphasize the role of 
jihadism as like a core component that that goes kind of under acknowledged and that that is part of what is very much driving the conflict or, and which makes it into an asymmetric warfare because one side is not playing by the same rules, right? Because they mm-hmm. are are pining for an everlasting second life, right? So stop me if there's anything that I've said wrong there in terms of framing jihadism as the central component of that conflict, motivating it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, I, I mean, I th- I'm sure I know where you're going here. Let me just... Um perhaps save you some time. I fully acknowledge that in many of these conflicts, and certainly in the conflict with the Palestinians between Israel and the Palestinians, there are other layers to the problem. And there's a layer of nationalism. Uh, you know, Hamas is, Hamas is, if you were going to ask, you know, what is the difference between a group like Hamas and a group group like the, the Islamic State? That the, the variable of nationalism is 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 uh, certainly a, a lot of the difference, right? And and for from that for that reason, you know the the Islamic state, a jihadist organization like the Islamic State, would view Hamas as a kind of uh, you know a, uh, an apostate organization, right? And the fact that they have the goal of a nation state uh, is anathema, right? Um, so yeah, so it's not just jihadism. But the thing that worries me most about this conflict and about um, uh, many of these other conflicts is the is the fanatical religious layer of it. That that's the thing that makes it truly insoluble, from my point of view. If it was just ordinary nationalism, even if you add a layer of terrorism onto nationalism, as you did in you know in the the, the so called troubles in 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 Ireland, right? It's like that's. I, the, the, the troubles would be would have been f- a, much more troublesome, you know. Granted, they were awful, but they would be they would have been much worse if you added a layer of fanatical commitment to martyrdom and jihad, right? Like that's that makes things worse, and that and that's that's always the point I want to bang on about that. That if you're not going to acknowledge that piece of it, you know, like the cancer on top of the the bacterial infection. We're not we're not talking about what's real. I think completely that like any account which doesn't acknowledge the role of j- jihadism and extremist ideologies would be absolutely you know incomplete. Like you you can't deal with Islamic extremism without talking about the underlying ideology. But one of the issues that I I have with the way that you've presented it is that whenever you are talking about the need to take into account what you know the the extremists say, right, and and to look at what they are telling us, right, the the issue of Tabik for you know why we hate you, you've commented on it and that kind of thing. There are various statements from Hamas and other groups active in that area, which come across as, you know, motivated by jihadist ideology and they want to wipe Israel out and uh, it's a holy war. But at the same time, there are also statements which very clearly link it to political grievances, especially national grievances. And Mm -hmm. in the off-referenced Hamas charter, right, that they started with, they did produce a more moderate one. Now, I'm not saying you've got to hand it to Hamas for for doing that or take them at the word, but I'm right. saying that the fact that they would remove the section, right, that specifically is openly anti-Semitic, openly mm-hmm. stating that they're going to wipe Israel out, doesn't that contradict the image that you're suggesting that, you know, if these are people that are purely motivated by going to heaven, why don't you see so many more martyrs, why would you find things like them will trying to moderate language in a in a new charter? Why not double down? Doesn't that like somewhat contradict the the notion that it's purely about the religious ideology from well, their it's own not, mouths? It's not purely again, it's not it's not purely I, I think it's purely the problem is more or less purely religion, right? I mean if everyone were were Sunni Muslim in the region, we'd have no problem, right? Um, so re- religious tribalism is is the the major variable here, but jihadism itself is is an, an additional problem. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I you know I can I think be forgiven for not trusting 
Hamas, uh, I, I think that their original charter is far closer to what they really believe and really want than their their subsequent refinement of it, which is still, you know, not not good. It's only just good by comparison. Um, I just think they're, you know, they're politically, you know, perhaps a little savvier than they they used to be. They 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 realize they have to export this, you know, their their product to to the rest of the world and use the the rest of the world as leverage, but uh, against Israel. But I mean, still, I mean, just look at how carefree they are with respect to their, their atrocities. I mean, they're just, they're, they're not, they don't really, they're not really trying to seem like rational actors uh, to the rest of the world. I mean, you know, you don't burn families alive uh, and, and, and shoot it on your GoPros um, and then drag, you know, uh, dismembered bodies through the streets and, 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 you know, bloodied hostages and, you know, kidnap babies. And, and, uh, uh, it's just the, the idea that, that they're, that would, they're moderated in a way that I should care about is, is, um, you know, fairly absurd. It's not, still, even I'm in the not, charter. yeah, I'm not saying you should care for that. It's more that, as you mentioned, the terror that they unleashed on October 7th is very well documented. Yet you have lots of their supporters and maybe actually a majority doubting many of the things that happened, right? You have the, the Hamas stating that they didn't target civilians, right? Yeah. In various statements, like Hamas officials make different kinds of statements. But the point is that if you are right, and it is just about a holy war and paradise, why even pretend in that case? Because if it's good to to kill Jews as many as you can, why why cast doubts that there's a conspiracy? Why not say that you are just about targeting the infidels? Well, well for the, but for, in in most cases they're not. I mean, most cases you know the the leaders of Hamas in the immediate aftermath. I don't know what they've said since, but but they said they would they would do this as as many times as they could. Right? They were not until, they, but until they're just they're they're, they're splitting it differently than you, I think you're suggesting. They're just saying that there are no non-combatants in Israel. They're all combatants because they're occupying land that's not theirs. Right? All these they're all settlers. They're all they're all uh, you know colonists. Uh, I mean, it's all it's all it's all illegitimate. Right? From the river to the sea. So it's not so like if they're killing teenagers at a at a, a rave, these are they're, they're not disposed to distinguish between them and soldiers carrying guns, right? It's just that's they're all combatants. I'm not. I, I, I'm certainly not claiming like Hamas is an ethical organization that is making those. I'm saying that various members of their leadership and supporters make appeal to that, which suggests that they aren't occupying the, the kind of justification space that you're suggesting the majority I, I, of Listen, them are. I would agree. And I've said this, I've said this before. I think it's a distinction that doesn't make much of a difference in the present case, but Hamas, tr- certainly historically, I mean, prior to October 7th, if you had asked me to compa- compare Hamas and the Islamic State, I would have said the Islamic State was much scarier than Hamas, much more of a of a real jihadist organization than Hamas is, and I would still say that to some considerable degree, and and, and yet Hamas, even with all of its sort of quasi terrestrial goals, was still capable of of you know medieval barbarism, which they seem committed to replicating whenever they're given the chance. Um, Yes, the, the the Islamic State is the much purer case of of where jihadism li- leads and 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 it's what it what it looks like in 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 the pure you know in a petri dish, right? I mean that, that's that's the that's the unadulterated strain, the Islamic State. So I guess the flip side, uh, and it, it relates to that, is that whenever discussing like Israel, that. Yourself and I would I would say Douglas Murray as well, who you've had on the channel, are are rightly kind of pushing back at the equivalence that we that we see on the far left, right, or the the kind of anti-Semitism that is clearly there in the reaction to the October seventh attack. But in so doing, there's often a loss of nuance that on the Israel side, you you have also religious extremists and not. 
just fringe extremists with no influence, right? You have a member of the government, um, Ben mm. Gavir, who had the poster of the Goldstein massacre guy, right? The person who went in and gone down. That's somebody in the Israeli government who had a, yeah. a poster in the wall of a terrorist and one Netanyahu kind of supporting the increasing settlement movement and courting yeah. the far right, the religious right. So my kind of point there is if you present that conflict as being, you know, purely about the forces of civilization versus like a religious fanatical cult, and don't mention that there is a fanatical religious cult that is in the government of Israel and has made various statements which are similarly talking about the, the promised land and, and reclaiming it, that mm. it seems like you're being selective. And it doesn't mean that you have to say they're both equal in that respect. You can still completely condemn Hamas and, and all, all the things. You can still argue that Israel has a right to defend itself, but it doesn't require serving as their kind of propaganda wing, because lots of Israelis were very unhappy with Netanyahu and his government. It is a very right-wing government. And the last thing I'll say, and I'll give you a chance to respond, Sam, is like the ex-Israeli prime minister who was assassinated, Rabin, he wasn't assassinated by Islamic extremists. Yeah. He was assassinated by a Jewish extremist who derailed the peace negotiations that were going on. And the legacy of which was that Netanyahu, who was in opposition to Rabin, you know, ended up in power. So the history over there is very complex in that. But I'm arguing, isn't there a case that the presentation yourself and Douglas Murray have done kind of whitewashes those concerns, which which no, are legitimate? No. I mean, I I raise those points um, a fair amount. It's just in proportion to the problem on the the Islamic side they're they're quite small i mean they, they, it's they're very unhelpful i would fully grant to you that netanyahu has has been a disaster his support for the settlements has been provocative uh he's to some degree culpable for what happened on october 7th if for no other reason that he you know his attention was split you know and he was he was propping up the settlements in the west bank and and leaving the, the border with gaza you know fairly undefended right so um but yeah all, you know, all the mad work that the, that the settlers are doing in the West Bank um, and the re religious extremists who support them, um, all of that is, is incredibly unhelpful and I don't support it at all. I mean, I've said in other contexts, I thought that the settlers should be dragged off contested land by their beards, right? I mean, that's not a, a fair, that's not a, um, a, uh, a, optically a great thing to say uh, in the aftermath of October 7th, but you know, I'm Jewish and I can say whatever I want on the topic. Um, I think those people are religious imbeciles and they're, uh, they're creating immense harm, right? And they're, and, and they're, they're imagined claims upon real estate based on where they think Abraham walked um, uh, shouldn't be supported because, you, you know, I, I think it's very unlikely Abraham even existed at this point. Um, so religious maniacs in every context are, are, uh, you know, are people I, I would, uh, you know, they're, they're, these are views and behaviors I, I would condemn. But again, we have to be alert to the differences, the differences both re with respect to the sheer numbers of people and their influence, but also w with respect to the specific beliefs that they're maniacally adhering to and the and the the logical and behavioral consequences of those beliefs. I mean, the differences really do matter, and it matters that Judaism does not have a clear conception of the afterlife, uh, and much less one that could really motivate uh, a a a, care, a carefree attitude toward martyrdom, right, and the martyrdom of one's children. As I'm not saying that there aren't Jews who aren't willing to die for their beliefs. I mean, there's there are people who are willing to die for their beliefs. You know, there are all flavors of those sorts of people. But there's something about the doctrines of martyrdom and jihad that are especially unhelpful, right? And when you look at just the sheer numbers, there are 15 million Jews on earth, and most Jews don't believe anything that I care about. Um, there's very little commitment to otherworldly propositions and the supernatural among Jews generally. They're just an overwhelmingly secular and even agnostic group of people. And then you have the ultra-Orthodox who, um, yes, are, are 
believe whole, whole rafts of divisive nonsense that I don't support. And I think they should be politically disenfranchised insofar as that's possible in Israel. Um, and uh, yeah, when you when you can find one of them who's 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 saying idiotic things about uh, some kind of counter genocide, you know, or talking about you know the, the Amalekites in the Bible that, that needed to get you know wiped out down to down to the last child, uh, you, let's let's kill their livestock as well, right? It's you know sheer religious barbarism, you know, Taliban style that I, uh, you know, would never support. But again, there's so few of these people. Yes, a few of them are in the wrong places. A few of them are in, you know, too close to, to power in Netanyahu's government. Um, but there really isn't much of an analogy to draw between the two sides. And if, if, the, if the Jews in Israel were behaving like the Palestinians, if, 80, if they were committing analogous atrocities, you know, going into music festivals in the West Bank and raping and burning teenagers and then supporting it to the tune of 80%. Once you export these details to the rest of Israeli society, you had Jews dancing in the streets over these 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 moral victories. And when you poll them, 80% claim to support the atrocity just committed, right? Uh, or they, or they're just riddled with conspiracy theories about how it never happened, right? And you can't. There's just no way to have a reality-based discussion with these people because they're so addled by their religious mania, right? If that were true of the Jews of Israel, I would condemn them in precisely the same terms that I condemn jihadism and its influence in in the Palestinian uh, community. There was a poll done recently, Sam, and it was discussed by Rory Stewart, who you recently had on the podcast, where they polled Israeli public about how concerned they should be about the suffering of civilians in Gaza. And there was yeah. it was a similar percentage, something like 80% that said it shouldn't be a concern, right? That the priority should be the right. wiping out of, of Hamas. And I think for a lot of people, they do see an equivalence, not they don't see the equivalence in terms of like that the Israel IDF is just going in and, and you know, mowing down civilians at a, a, a rave. But they do look at the fact that there's huge amounts of people starving with no access to water now in Gaza, right? And that there is a huge death toll, no matter whether you think the war is justified or not, it is absolutely the case that there's huge amounts of unjustified suffering there. And so you point that, you know, the kind of Islamist and jihadism, but I would say that is creating really fertile ground for, in general, just a psychology of justified grievance. And, uh, yeah. you know, if you have a proud people, that is uh, going to be remembered. It will lead to support for more extreme groups. If you remove Hamas, I would hope there's a chance for like more moderate things, but it doesn't seem that the most punitive response possible targeting civilian populations. And I'm, I'm not saying like targeting civilian populations on purpose, right? I am talking about it yeah. being a collateral of attempting to remove Hamas from civilian populations. But in that respect, whenever you have organizations like the Tamil Tigers, right? That was a Marxist organization with Hindu members that was pioneering suicide attacks. There, you don't have a very strong well, they learned, reference. They learned to, it from Hezbollah, but yes, they were pioneering it after they learned it from Hezbollah. But in that respect of being able to motivate people for it, you know, Rory Stewart raised the point as well, that if people are very strongly wedded to a particular ideology, be it Marxism, be it whatever the case might be, you don't always need a paradise in order to motivate people. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of layering in two points. One is that what is happening in Gaza now is undoubtedly a, a humanitarian crisis with huge suffering. And that yeah. will motivate, it seems certainly possible to motivate more extremism in response. And related to that, that it isn't just the jihadist and afterlife narratives that enable people to end up like being willing to sacrifice themselves for causes. You, you see it all the time in nationalist causes. In, in World War II for different reasons with, you know, Japan and so on. So those two points that there is a level of huge suffering going on at the minute, and it's it's in Gaza, right, primarily, yeah. not in Israel. Yeah, well, I, I think there are th probably three points in there I should respond to. <clears throat> One is just this comparison between the 
the moral status of the people suffering in Gaza, the innocent victims of of um, bombing, of, you know, so-called collateral damage, which is it was the euphemism we tend to use here, and the let's take the you know the teenagers massacred at the the music festival by Hamas, right? There, there's mm. a very important difference between those two groups of people. You know, the the, the first are being victimized. However, surely they're being victimized. It is inadvertent. It is not desired on the Israeli side. For the mo- leave aside the sociopathic fanatic who wants to kill Palestinian children. Generally speaking, if if the IDF could go in there and kill only Hamas, you know, if you gave them magical weapons, what would they do with them? They would kill only Hamas, right? And they would turn Gaza into, you know, the south of France. Right. I mean, I mean, it's clarifying to ask, what would people do if you gave them the power to do anything they want? What would they do? What would members of Hamas do? They would kill all the Jews on earth. No question. Right. And many other people. Right. They, they, and what would the Islamic State do? They would turn the whole world into the hellhole that they created in Syria and Iraq. Right. They, that's exactly the way they like it. Crucifying apostates and blasphemers you know, taking sex slaves, all of it, right? None of that was an aberration. That's exactly what they wanted, right? What would, what would, you know, what would Dick Cheney have done, you know, in the invasion of Iraq? Would he have killed everybody? No, he would have turned Iraq into Oklahoma, right? Um, So it's it's important to, 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 to track people's actual motives. What kind of world do they want to build? Like, what do they want for other people? What are, just how zero sum are they, right? Wait, who do, Sam, who do they Sam I got to jump. I got. I got to jump in there because I mean, I'm not sure if that analogy is helpful. I mean, well, like well, I let me give you just it. let me let me just give you one aspect before you jump in. Let me just give you the one real world variant of it, which you really can't argue with. What 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 did we do to Germany and Japan? We the Allies do to Germany and Japan after World War II. What what really what revealed our motives? with respect to the German people and the Japanese people. I and mean, we killed a whole lot of innocent people, right? I mean, the firebombing of Dresden and Tokyo, I mean, it's just, you know, to say nothing of the nuclear bombs we dropped. I mean, indiscriminate violence of a sort that is, Israel is not, simply not practicing now at all, right? It doesn't matter how many kids die in Gaza, Israel is not doing what we did in World War II at all. Yeah. No, I, I um, think those points. I, I, I now, but our revealed preference, uh, it, it, our preference was revealed with respect to what what we did after we won. Did we just take yeah, them no, all, I, all the all the pretty girls as sex slaves? Is that what we did in Germany and Japan? Did we no, did we I kill all the you know all the 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 fighting age males? No, we no, we helped are, those build those two societies. Right, yeah, we you've, we you've, we you've wanted. Made- we wanted sane collaborators in Germany and Japan, and we got them. Amazing, right? No, you've you've made that point well. I, I, one of your points was about the stated intentions, right? And and right. versus um, unpleasant side effects. Okay, so, um, so those, but those, that's I, I, that's I, I, why you can't I, I, use body count to resolve this issue, right? It's like it doesn't matter that the Israelis have killed more Palestinians than Hamas killed in Israel. Right, that's not the way it's to think this, about it's this, it. It's this collateral damage and like sort of um, unpleasant necessities is is not always such a clear thing. Like the 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 limit to that thought experiment, I think, is illustrated by say communism in Southeast Asia. Take the Khmer Rouge, Pol Pot. You know, like their stated goal was to build a utopian communist society. If they had the power no, to do anything no, they no. want, they they wouldn't just massacre a bunch of people. They would turn them into very good politically aligned communists. But unfortunately, they had to kill. An awful lot of people because out of necessity. Right. Okay. But so, the, but there are yes, there are Orwellian projects. There are situations where words don't mean what we what they seem to mean. You can't you can't just track these superficial sentences so as to to get to the moral core of of what someone is attempting to do. Is I mean, what are what are what are people's real intentions with respect to other people? I mean, whatever Kim Jong Un says about North Korea. We know what his intentions are, right? He's turned that into a prison state because he's a total sociopath, right? It's not it's not like he wants everyone to be happy and well fed and prosperous. He wants he wants to rule like like a sadist 
over a, a prison population. And that's what he's doing. Would that mean that we don't take into account that there are various statements made by senior figures in Israel, which suggest mm. that, like, for example, well or not, they, they want to do it. If the Gaza population relocated to Egypt, that wouldn't be a terrible thing, right? And yeah. so if, if Ben Gavir or uh, so on have made various extreme statements, which, which in the same like, respect... Honestly, suggest- that's not all that extreme. I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I don't know how... I mean, he's just running. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not supporting him, they, but you know, th- it's hard to see how Israel survives in the long term. I, it's hard to see how Israel is a viable project uh, under the on this the, the, with the current assumptions of a so-called two-state solution. I don't know. I don't know how it works. I mean, they, either they're not really states, or something has radically changed about the the cultures. But there's no one-state solution given what most Islamists and jihadists and you know conservatives among the Palestinians actually want, right? I mean that's that's a recipe for for uh, at, at the minimum just a demographic change that is is not compatible a, with a demog- the endurance of a Jewish state. A demographic change where the entire our population of Gaza is relocated to a different country, and that the country is then subsumed in the part of Israel. That would be. Right. Like genocide, right? At least cultural. No, no, no it's not genocide. No, 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 no. Genocide has it's a specific my, meaning. Okay, genocide okay has, but at, at very least, then it, it is a forced you mean, relocation. You mean ethnic of cleansing? You mean you mean ethnic cleansing, right? Which is a word, right, which is right, a phrase yeah. that's often used along geno- along with genocide, and they are worlds apart with respect to their moral implications. I mean, history is just full of ethnic cleansing, which, which means people moving. Right, people who can't get along wind up moving yeah, apart. Right, that happens a, a hell of a lot, and it's you know, it, it can be awful in terms of you know when when done at the point of a sword, which happened, uh, which happened in, under under Islam again and again and again. I mean, nobody's losing sleep over the Jews that got run out of Syria and Yemen and and Iraq and Egypt and Morocco and. All after 1948, right? Like no one's talking about their right of return. You know what happened to their homes? The UN's not worrying about that, right? And yet everyone is worried about the Palestinians as this perpetual refugee population. What about all the people who left Syria in 2015 and went to to Sweden, right? Okay, they've been. But that, they, are, are, do so they have perpetual refugee status, or are they just now in Sweden? So, Sam, just to clarify, so you are saying that like. Ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strait isn't extreme position. Two million no, no, I, people it's, it's, in the current. It's totally extreme. It is totally extreme in in that it's a non-starter. I mean, no, like no one, no one in the Palestinian world wants that, right? And the Arab and uh, you know, the if you look at the Arab state's contribution to the status quo over the last fifty years. It has been very deliberately to hold the the Palestinians in perpetual refugee status, so as to uh, to put the the existence of Israel in question perpetually. And when you look at how the Jordanians and the Egyptians treat the Palestinians, you know it's you know they're just as culpable for. I mean, to take Egypt, as, you know, uh, which which co- cover which uh, governs the board one of the borders of Gaza, right? It, it is just as culpable for keeping Gaza a quote open air prison as Israel is, right? Um, because they're maintaining one of their borders, and they don't want the Palestinians in, in their society either. Um, but it's a. Well, we do um, recognize the desire for self determination, and like you know, I'm not talking about from the river to the sea, like recapturing yeah. the the land. I mean, purely a people regarding their homeland as as being occupied or taken or that they've been moved that that is hugely fertile ground for you know breeding conflict and extremism and that kind of, of thing. i just like i maybe i'm a little bit more sensitive to this as somebody from northern ireland right and right. Th- there just i know the situation is not as comparable in terms of the level of suffering involved in that kind of thing but there you have for example a republican party Sinn Féin, that doesn't recognize the legitimacy 
of British control of the Northern Irish state, right, but still gets elected in the power. They were associated with a terrorist group, the IRA. Um, they're now, I think, the biggest party in the Republic of Ireland as well. And their overall long-term plan is to see Ireland reunited, right, into a unified right. thing. But they are a political party that people have to deal with and they have renounced violence and you know it's a different situation i'm not drawing the parallel in terms of like saying well hamas is just you know the ira in waiting no 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 i'm saying though that those kind of very strong feelings about the right to self-determination yeah if you relocated the population out of gaza like that would be the second Nakba, wouldn't it? And the first Nakba led to a conflict that's lasted for longer than we any of us have been alive. Well, the, the analogy to Ireland, you, you, to make it a real analogy, I mean, there are reasons why it doesn't work great, but you'd also have to imagine you know, a dozen other Irish-speaking <laughs> states with Irish culture surrounding this whole problem that those the 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 Northern Irish would be displaced to. If they had their Nakba of dis, of ethnic cleansing, right? Like it's a it's a different situation where you you, you would you have, have to. I mean, wonder why I, it's, it's completely different. It's a completely different situation because I've had people say, you know, like, uh, well, you wouldn't just allow the British to bomb Belfast, right, to get rid of the IRA during the troubles, and that's true. But if the IRA had launched a raid on a city in the UK and killed a bunch of people and stolen babies, I think you actually would have seen you know, significant military action in wherever they they took the, the children away to. So it, it, there are not parallels one-to-one. But in the notion of like, you know, the British arranged plantations, moved populations over, and mm. the Northern Ireland ended up Listen, with like a demographic. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I completely understand the, national, the nationalistic and uh, aspirations of the Palestinians, and there is an analogy to any other any other group of people that want their own nation. Um, but the, but the moral core of this problem and the and the asymmetry of it is it, it should be unignorable. And and it's this if and this is this is you know a statement that you've probably heard me make and you've probably heard Douglas Murray make it, but it's it's nonetheless true, which is if if the if the Palestinians put down their weapons if they were peaceful right if they and, and even if they were peaceful protesters of a you know a gandhian sort right they would th- this this problem would be solved and the two societies could live happily together there would be a two state solution there would have been a two state solution decades ago if the but, the but Jews that, of Israel, just to point there well, let, let me just land the, might, well, let me just land the, the is, obvious statement the obvious statement okay, is okay, if the sorry. Jews of Israel put down their weapons there would be a genocide right that is October seventh reveals that to be as objectively true as a statement as we can make in these in these in this sort of area. So the the only point I was going to raise there is like you've had Netanyahu come out and say there won't be a two state solution. We can't. But that's because uh, of who the Palestinians are and because of what is how Islam is informing their worldview, right? If Islam were a peaceful religion, if Islam was Jainism, and there was no notion of of jihad. We would have a completely different situation, right? If they were, if they were, if they had a leader, if they were producing leaders like Gandhi, right, who were who you know, or Martin Luther King Jr., right, they would, it would be a completely different situation. That's not what. So, so Netanyahu, and again, Netanyahu is awful, and and again, culpable for the the, the disaster he's presiding over, right? Um, so Israel needs better leaders, right? But. He is reacting to the re- to to the ongoing reality of what the what the Palestinians and even the surrounding Muslim states have wanted since Israel was born seventy some odd years ago, right? And it's that and and it's so much of the conversation it has been explicitly genocidal as to make anything other than a a very strong defensive posture. Uh, unthinkable uh, for for the Israelis. Wouldn't that imply that when there was a much greater chance of a two state solution, when you know the negotiations were were going on, and they, in part, were there were people on the Palestinian side who tried to scupper that, right? Who were doing uh, suicide we had, attacks we had a and atrocities. But you also did have atrocities committed by 
extremists on, on the right who are now people involved with those movements are in the government. So it isn't fair to say that okay, there's like it's, just it's a, a one- tiny number. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous when you when you focus on it. It's like Biden just pa- passed an executive order that focused on four Israelis in in the West Bank. Like literally the president of the United States created an executive order that dealt with the 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 uh, um, the destructive behavior of four people on the on the Israeli side, right? I mean, it's like it, it, in order to give some what semblance of balance to the situation, it's just not an analogous problem. I, I, I'll I mean, I'll stipulate everything of that sort. You know, the 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 uh, the, the massacre at a mosque that kills twenty five people once in a generation, right, is awful and de- and decidedly unhelpful. Right and yes, a religious extremist is uh, on the Jewish side is is who assassinated Rabin, right? And it was a religious extremist on the Hindu side who killed Gandhi, right? There are those people, but there's just not the analogous problem, you know, there or anywhere else. I mean, we have not had to deal with crazy security concerns getting on airplanes for the last 25 years because so many Jews want to blow themselves up on airplanes. It's just not, it just has not been the problem. And if it were, that's the problem I would be focusing on. Well, I, I, I think we might disagree on the degree to which the far right in Israel has a significant presence in the government, but uh, there's, well, there's no, one I, more. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. I'm saying that's, it's, that's terrible and should change. And it, I think it will change. I mean, the reason why it hasn't changed yet is because, again, this is, they're in the middle of this emergency and, and this war and, you know, and Netanyahu is a very Trumpian figure is using this emergency to prolong his life as a as a political figure. But I think at the first opportunity, Netanyahu will be out of office. Right. I just think that that is the base, the general sentiment among Israelis. I mean, he, he's most Israelis. I don't know. I don't know what the recent polls say, but I have to think something close to 80 percent of Israelis are furious w- w- with Netanyahu. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think um, I- I've actually heard really good stuff from moderate progressive Israelis, and also really good stuff from moderate people in Gaza, Palestinians, mm-hmm. and um, they-, they don't sound that different, to be honest. Um, and I-, I think um, I think most reasonable people have uh, a lot of sympathy with, obviously, the victims of terrorist attacks, and and also the the civilians who are killed by indiscriminate. Bombing. I, I guess. Look, I'm just going to make one. But it is. Point, it is different. It just it's like, again, we can't lose sight of. I mean, b- body count just does not get at the moral difference yep. between the you two sides. That yeah, uh, but that, that it's point. a point that, you know, like, again, people forget it. Whenever it, it's just, the, it, it can't be. I. It yeah, can't maintain I, I its salience in the face of uh, of images fr- of of d- dead children being pulled out of rubble in Gaza, right? It's just like, there's just no, there's, you have to, you have to sort of re- rerun the, the argument again, so as to, to g- gain some perspective on what's happening. No, look, I, and so I, th- I think, I think we all get that motivations matter, right? There, there is a difference between a child who is killed by a bomb that wasn't targeted at them and a child who was executed by a terrorist. Um, I mean, to give a very anodyne time, example- yeah, children. To give an anodyne, a very anodyne example, but this is this this makes the point from the other side, right? Like, you, like the three of us live in societies where there's some ambient level of of carnage due to um, car accidents every year, and it's totally predictable. I mean, in the United States, there will be something like forty thousand people killed this year on our highways. Right. And it's just because people are bad drivers and, you know, eventually self-driving cars will solve this problem, but not yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, we know with it to a moral certainty that we could reduce all this death and suffering if we just lowered the speed limit. Right. Just made it like wherever it's wherever you can drive 60 miles an hour. Let's let's cap that at 30 miles an hour. We would save thousands of lives, probably tens of thousands of lives in, in, in America. Right. We don't do it. Are we just just sociopathic murderers for not doing that? Is that like every day of our lives? Are we like Saddam Hussein level 
evil bastards for not doing that. No, we're not even thinking about it, right? It's like, it's just not even, it's, and, and when you bring it up, it, it's just kind of a curiosity. It's like, well, yeah, but that would just be so boring to drive a maximum of 30 miles an hour. It would take forever. There'd be some other, it'd be economic costs. No, no. Um, we totally get it. With the, the right. point is well you made, know, um, and, and, like, and likewise, yeah. if, if if there was an equivalent number of car deaths, but they were being caused by murderers, right? Then there would be an outcry, yeah. and extreme measures would be taken to to stop it. No, yes. I, so it just I, it, I it, it, all that. those details really do matter. Yeah. I look. Yeah. The only point that I'll inject into this, and I don't think it's too controversial, is just that perhaps the reason why I don't attribute all of the responsibility for the terrorist attacks to religion specifically right and and the pernicious ideas mm. that are in religion and all three of us are atheists right none of none of us lo- like religion um <laughs> is just that i recognize that one the the social and political context matters and there's a big driver for why people do the things they do why they're attracted to an, an ideology right there's a reason why you know, even though you have fundamentalist Christians in the United States, they're not blowing stuff up because they're relatively comfortable. No one's taken away their farms and things like that. And and the second thing is just that I have to acknowledge that there is an asymmetry, right? In the in Northern Ireland, the the Irish were were, were blowing up bombs, right? And they were doing that, I don't think, because they were contaminated by worse ideas than the British. There was a power asymmetry there. Right, they didn't have the option mm-hmm. to send in regiments of armored cars and things like that. Like that was the only tactic they had. And I think we just have to acknowledge that there are asymmetries there of different kinds. You pointed to one legitimate one, which is one of motivations and stated stated intentions and so on. But there's also asymmetries in terms of the relative power differential, and that defines what tactics are even available to you. One side has planes and can drop guided bombs. The other side doesn't. They send in guys on bloody motorbikes and paragliders or whatever. So that's that's just my, my point there. Sam, I might yep. have a, uh, a last topic that we before we let you uh, skip. Do you have time? Um, Do you have time? Do you have okay, time for I'm, one uh, last thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually uh, past my cutoff. But what, what's the topic? Let's see how quickly can we touch it? Uh, okay, let's see if we can th- clear it. Um, Give me a so, know what it is and then I'll, I'll uh, see if it's possible. I wanted to talk about, you know, pornography of doubt and conspiracism, taking account of it on the, on the left and right. And in particular, the, the kind of growth of people who are very selective in the criticism of it, right? That, that they are documentarians of the opposing side, but not on their own side. And, uh, some, some questions about that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just let's do it, uh, briefly. Cause I do have to jump, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I know where you're going, but you feel free to sharpen it up with a specific example. Okay. So like I said, you know, you've raised the point quite articulately about the, the pornography of doubt and, and of various people, you know, that, that institutions aren't perfect and that, you know, that mm-hmm. there are plenty of things that you can criticize in institutions. There are ideological things in various institutions that should be criticized and are criticized, but that we need institutions and that we should try to be fair in calling out whenever people are engaging in selective condemnation. And Mm -hmm. in that respect, I'm wondering about currently, for example, just to give one illustrative example for you to deal with. Douglas Murray has been has been very strong condemning all of the equivalents around the October 7th and the, the rise of anti-Semitism. Very, very vocal opponent of that, arguing with various people, you know, in a passionate way. On the other hand, he was a defender, him and various other people in, in that sphere, uh, Jordan Peterson and so on, of Orban's government, which made mm-hmm. use of anti-Semitic tropes, right, and rolled back various democratic uh, things, the independence of the judiciary, and so on. And Anne Applebaum has kind of made this point talking about intellectual clerics who defend authoritarianism, right? And uh, I'm not talking about people who are MAGA, Trump, right-wing maniacs, right? I'm more talking about that kind of selective application and uh, that if you were concerned, for example, about anti-Semitism and rising authoritarianism and ideologies that are anti-liberal, you should be very concerned about things like what is happening 
in Hungary or, or Turkey just as much as you are with things going on in the broader Muslim world? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I agree. Except emergencies make strange bedfellows, right? And and you know, Douglas has been focused much more on on the erosion of uh, basic sanity in Europe than than I have been, right? So I, I have much more of an American perspective on on a lot of these questions. Um, you know, so the the refugee crisis in 2015 that that hit Europe uh, to an extraordinary degree hit. America much less so, and and Douglas was was all over that, and I think that's probably when he had some uh, entanglement with Orban. Uh, but I, I really don't know the details there. Um, I know I, I I know Douglas to be a um, an incredibly sane and courageous voice on the specific issues we've been talking about. I mean, specifically, you know, Islamism, jihadism. Um, the uh, identitarian uh, politics of the left that has that has blinded so many people to the threat of of jihadism and Islamism in the West. I mean, the fact that you have three hundred thousand people uh, coming out in essentially in support of Hamas after October seventh in the streets of London. Um, I think that's unsustainable. I mean, that's I, you know, I share Douglas's alarm about that. I mean, D- Douglas, you know, you you have people, you have MPs, you know, uh, for stepping down from Parliament, who because they're they're they perceive their security concerns to be too difficult around these issues in the UK. Um, yeah, I just you know, I mean, D- the, the truth is, that I don't even think Douglas can spend much time in the UK and and be safe at this point. And it's not because he's a He's a bigot who's antagonized otherwise rational people. No, there, there's a stealth Islamist jihadist um, uh, takeover of of uh, you know the p- public space in 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 the UK. Uh, you know at these moments, and the the authorities, the institutions, don't quite know what to do about it. Right? I mean, they're completely ineffectual. Uh, with respect to to policing this problem and um, getting rid of of you know uh, uh, imams who are actually preaching the for the destruction of of the UK right I mean the 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 barbarians have been let inside the gates there's no question of that and it's a much bigger problem in the UK than it is in the in the United States and you know at, at this point I it's 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 important that the people in the, in the U.S. figure out how not to make the mistakes that many Western European countries have made with respect to the spread of of um, of Islamism. Right? I'm not talking about all Muslims. Right? I'm talking about Islamists and jihadists. Um, in fact, the first people I would want to see immigrate to my society are actual secular Muslims, or you know, better yet. Ex-Muslims, right? I mean, those are the ex-Muslims are the most valuable people on earth, as far as I'm concerned, with respect to this issue, right? You know, give me, give me, uh, you know, a hundred million people like uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali or Yasmin Muhammad or Sarah Hader, or like the, the, these people are exactly what you, the people you want in your society, right? And then after them, you want, li- you know, actual liberal Muslims, right? So it's not this is not a, a Muslim ban on immigration, but this this idiotic idea that you can a- and absorb absorb an endless number of people who have zero interest in assimilating, and what's what's more, they're they're importing a triumphal vision of Islamic supremacy into your society and anti-Semitism and misogyny, right? And Douglas is living on the front line of that clash of civilizations. In an extraordinarily brave way, right? And his security, can, you, you know, you, 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 his security, security concerns are not security <laughs> concerns you would want, and they're coming from only one group of people, right? Predictably, right? Yeah, I can imagine that. So I maybe I can tune it up the point Sam a bit, which is that granted various concerning tendencies on the social justice left, and you you can 
there are different opinions about the degree to which you know that has captured all scientific institutions, all education, all media. But given the people that we cover in this podcast, right, the the most uh, kind of unhinged guru types who are constantly setting themselves up as the solution to this problem, right? They're saying, don't trust academics. They lied about COVID. They they lie about you know uh, men and women. All of it. It's all bullshit. Don't trust the government, the CDC, everything. It's all corrupt. And then as an alternative, present themselves their podcast, which you've talked about, you know, the problems with podcastistan. But in that, there's a kind of, you know, what you, you talked about a pornography of doubt where you have people that are then posing populist right-wing alternatives. Douglas Murray was at the National Conservatism Conference in the, the mm-hmm. UK and the Art Conference. Those are not the moderate right-wing groups like Rory Stewart. Orban is not moderate right. That's populist right-wing, yeah. quite extreme yeah. right. And, so, and Douglas, the, Douglas and I, I I've, so let me just short circuit this because I am truly out of time, but I've never, I've I have never spoken with Douglas about any of that. I mean, I have not spoken with Douglas all that much. Um, I would, I would certainly be eager to talk to him about all of that and see what he was thinking and what he and what he thinks going forward. I can just, and you know, we might there might be some genuine daylight between us on those issues, but I can see in in extremis, I can see the impulse. To, I mean, you, you sort of have to pick the allies you can find, right? And in certain contexts, there are inconvenient alliances, right? I mean, and I, I could imagine if things were quite a bit worse in the U.S. with respect to the derangement of the left and the, the threat of, of re- the real threat of Islamism subverting much of what I care about in American society, which is which is where we are in the UK. Honestly, when when I saw those protests after October seventh, I thought, okay, London is ruined, right? It's just that that's just an awful situation. That this is this is the number of people you can get out in support of atrocity, right? Um, if that were the situation in the U.S., I might find find myself on stage with you know quasi theocratic Christians, right? Who who are like the last people who are, I could find to see eye to eye with me on this particular subject, right? The only, honestly, the only reliable people in the United States for the longest time on this subject, and it may to some degree, you know, to a first approximation, it's still true, are fundamentalist Christians. They're, they're the only people who don't. You don't have to burn endless amounts of of gas trying to convince that that that. Jihadists actually believe in paradise, right? I mean, when, when I'm at when I, when I'm at an academic conference talking to anthropologists, I can't get anyone to agree that anyone believes in paradise, right? It's just they 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 think it's all economics, it's all politics, it's all it's all propaganda, it's all posturing. <laughs> you you, you have to find a Christian. You have to kind of find a Christian fundamentalist in the crowd to 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 who, who at least <laughs> knows what it's like to believe in heaven. Right. So, I know. I know you. Got, I know you gotta. I know you gotta disappear. But I have to. I have to push back at that because I'm. I'm involved in the area about extremism research, and I've met. A, like I, you. I know you say uh, that often, but do, do, most do you know? Do you know Scott Tran? I do know Scott Tran. Do you, and do, I, do you know? I, do you, know I, Rich, you know Richard Schwader? Yes. Both so of the, them. The, have, both of them. Both of them face to face have denied that anyone believes in paradise to me. Right. Yes. But there's a much all, bigger on Scott and Trans count. It's all just bonding among fictive kin, you know, male, male bonding among, among fictive kin. It's all just like, you know, soccer players bonding. It's got nothing to and, do with paradise. It's got nothing to do with and expectation commitment, of martyrdom. And commitment to secret values is his right. model. So if your secret value yeah. is that there's right. a particular religious one, he would also put that in the thing. But it's in general, I would pure just say- delusion. You, this is pure delusion. But Ari A. Kruglansky, for example, or various others, there's a lot of models and a lot of them have prominent positions for ideology and take seriously. The the probably, you know, quest for significance is one of the most well-known and, and that can slot 
in very easily religious quest for significance. So I just I want to push back on that because I would encourage you to go to those conferences and see. I will have been. I mean, unfortunately, it sounds like I I just had the misfortune of of arguing with the dumb anthropologist. But yeah, um, honestly. This is what I've encountered. And the very, very last thing, Sam, is just that, you know, so I know your point about you might end up with uh, particular allies, you know, given your stance on a given topic. And in some cases, compromises are necessary or, or people are making more sense. But I can't help but think that, like, you know, I agree with Anne Applebaum's analysis that if you're someone that cares about liberal democracies yeah. and stuff, it is not right to, like, side with the, the far right people who are rolling back democratic institutions. Um, and there is a strong moderate left and right. It, you know, like the next leader in the UK is likely to be Keir Starmer. That's not Jeremy Corbyn. The right. leader in the Democrats is Joe Biden. Compared to Trump, compared to figures like Nigel Farage. I, I completely agree I, with you. I don't see them making Listen, more sense. I will, I will agree with Ann Applebaum all day long about anything that happens in Eastern Europe, right? I mean, it's just, there's, she's she's a national treasure as far as I, I can tell. Um, so that would be a great conversation. I mean, I, you know, I, I will try to get a, I'll try to put Ann Applebaum on a podcast with Douglas Murray and see where we get to, right? That could be yeah, fun. Yeah, on Hungary. On Hungary, yeah. that would be yeah. a, right. a, a pleasure. And so Let's I know we're over... The a lot of time and uh, it, as as predictable, uh, you know, we had some points of disagreement, but really appreciate you coming yeah. back, Sam, and uh, yeah, the discussing. Thanks, all thanks for the, the opportunity the to, to browbeat both of you and your audience. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Good to be browbeat. Good to be yeah, browbeat. Take care, you guys. Till next time. <laughs>